happy Wednesday, everyone. Welcome to our second class together. A few things I want to mention. The course webpage has been updated with uh, lab assistant hours. Uh, so our uh, course staff for this course is uh, Oliver Calder. Uh, he has been course staff for 208 many times. He will be an excellent resource this term. Uh, he has some hours uh, on Sundays and Mondays in the Olin 310 Computer Lab, uh, and he's also available uh, for one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, if that would be helpful, so uh, send him an email to set those up. Uh, there are also a number uh, of other CS lab assistants who have the, uh, whose hours are linked uh, from the course web page here, so you can find kind of who is going to be in the lab uh, when uh, throughout the week. Uh, and importantly, some lab assistants are taken to it, some have not. Uh, you're welcome to ask any of them for help, but should you want to ask someone who has taken the course before, uh, I have listed those, those folks here. Um, thank you to those of you who have uh, filled out the introductory survey on, on Moodle. Uh, if you haven't, uh, please do that this week. A uh, question that came up on those surveys a few times was about uh, working with partners on assignments. Uh, so uh, the first four lab assignments will be individual, and the last two, lab four and five, you'll have the option to, to work with a partner. Uh, any other questions on kind of class logistics uh, to get us started? All right, so you may be wondering what is the meaning of these uh, mysterious uh, numbers that I have set up around the room. Uh, these will be the basis for uh, an activity uh, that we're going to uh, use to get to know each other a little better. Um, and so I have... Uh, I have up here in three piles a uh, individualized program for each of you to follow. Uh, so each of these sheets uh, has a first name at the top, and then we're going to do five rounds, round zero through four. And in each round, you will be given a one of these locations, zero, one, two, three, four, five, or six, where you will go to. Uh, and you'll be introducing yourself to uh, your classmates at that location. Some of you will be uh, uh, guardians. You'll stay at the same location the whole time. Uh, some of you will be, be marchers. You'll just kind of move one location each time. And most of you will be wanderers. You'll be going all over. Uh, uh, this is... Uh, uh, should result in the in the uh, kind of maximum number of meeting new people uh, given given this arrangement. So these three piles are, are alphabetical. Uh, uh, H through I in this pile by first name. Uh, uh, K through um, uh, N in this pile, and O through Z here. So come up. Grab, uh, find your, your program, and then head to uh, the location for round zero. <coughs> All right, looks like everyone has a card. Uh, we'll be using these for review and, and practice exercises. So the way that this will work is I will put up a multiple choice question, like what is hex 8 plus hex 9? Uh, and there will be between one and, well, two and four possible answers. Uh, and if you look closely at your card, you can see that each side has one of the four letters on it, A, B, C, D. And so take a moment to think about adding these two hexadecimal numbers, and then hold up your card with the answer you choose on the top. So if I saw B was on the top here, I would hold up B and... When you hold up, make sure your fingers are not covering any part of the kind of uh, mini QR code, since I will need to be able to scan that.
All right, looks like we're ready to see what we're thinking. Wow. wow. <laughs> we're living in the future. <laughs> So I want to, to emphasize uh, these these questions are for practice only. Uh, these have these are not graded. Uh, doesn't doesn't matter uh, uh, about correctness. So uh, let me see. It's being a little slow. Uh, so here's what we're thinking in terms of A, B, C, D. Lots for C, but some votes for other ones. So please. Uh, Take a moment and discuss with your neighbors why you chose. Uh, we have some consensus on C, which is great. That is what we'll get here. Uh, can someone explain how you how you thought about adding these two hex numbers together? Well, uh, so I just added eight and nine together, and I got seventeen. Uh, but then in hex there is not seventeen. So you represent that one on the yeah, and then one and one. Yeah, like a, a 16 yeah. and a 1 make R 17. All right, none of that. Uh, yeah, and, and another way I might put it is when we add 8 and 8 in hex, we get 10. 8 and 8 give us 16, which is 10 in hexadecimal. So 8 and 8 would be 10 plus an extra 1 for, for 9. Any questions on this? All right, so I would like to uh, get into some discussion of how memory is actually structured and how we're going to think about working with memory. Uh, and so, one important idea is that memory in a computer system, we can think of a a large array of bytes. Now, byte is a term that I have not yet defined. And uh, last time we talked about uh, bits. Who can remind us what a bit is? Yeah. One or a zero? Yeah, it's a single binary digit of one or a zero. And a byte is eight bits. And so our computer's memory is going to be divided up into eight bit chunks. A long array of 8 bit chunks, and each of these chunks, each byte, gets a unique address. We think of it as an index into this array. So, in each element of an array, we would have like an index starting at 0, then 1, then 2, kind of all the way up to kind of whatever the maximum uh, index is. And These indexes, when we're working with memory, are referred to as addresses. And so each byte of memory has its own address. And I've written them in hex here, where all zeros would be the minimum address, all f's the maximum address. Uh, a bit of computer science humor for you. 
when it came time to decide what to call four bits, somewhere between one bit and a byte, people decided to call it a nibble, spelled with a Y. All right, so memory, uh, these eight big bit chunks called bytes. Each one has a unique address. And uh, each of these is one byte. And the number of bits, the number of kind of hex digits in our memory addresses is called the word size of the computer system. So the word size is the number of bits in a memory address. And uh, if you've ever heard of a 32-bit computer or a 64-bit computer, or you've uh, seen something like x64 and things like this, these are referring to kind of the word size of a particular computer. So most computers uh, uh, that you would, like new computers these days, would be kind of 64 bits. Now is this defined by the operating system? Uh, great question. This is... a property of the actual computer hardware. It is designed with a particular word size. So that's just baked in. Um, and you would need an operating system that sort of is designed for that particular word size. Yes? So, so would a 64-bit um, like computer have 64 different addresses? Yes, so that's uh, right where I'm heading, which okay. is uh, no, that's, that's, that's my, uh, my favorite thing. So uh, we know that the word size is the number of bits in the address. And so if I said the word size was two bits, uh, I have kind of two bits to use to represent a memory address. Uh, how many different memory addresses could I make out of these two bits? Yeah, I see people holding up four, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. If I had a word size of n bits, and someone uh, suggests a, how I would know how many different addresses I could form with n bits. Yeah. Why do you say 2 to the n? Um, because it's the number of permutations you get, right? So it's, because bits is 0 or 1, so 2 times 2 is my total of n. Exactly. I have two choices for the first bit, then two choices for the second, then two for the third, and kind of each bit of multiplied by two, the number of possible combinations. So if I have n bits, that gives me two to the n addresses. So if I have 64 bits, that's going to let me write down or express two to the 64 different addresses. So while well, my, my word size of two bits gives me, uh, I can address a total of four bytes. Which would be called the address space, kind of the, all the possible different addresses I can have uh, with a particular number of bits. Two to the 64 would be the address space when my word size is 64 bits. Um, that's 
something like 18 uh, billion billion bytes, or 64, or sorry, 18 exabytes. So uh, far more addresses than uh, any computer would actually have have memory. Yeah. Um, so if the addresses are taking up 64 bits, but it's only like showing a piece of memory that's eight bits, that so much of it is addressed. That's that's a great uh, a great question. Um, these addresses are not stored in memory. Just like if we think of an array, like the first element has index zero, but that zero is not actually like part of the array. It's just like our name for the first slot in the array. Similarly, like this 64-bit hex zero is just our name for this like spot in memory. So we don't actually uh, need to store every single uh, one of these addresses. Does that make sense? Uh, other questions? Yeah? Can you explain the context of this? Yeah, so our address space Describe as the range of possible addresses, or sometimes the number of possible addresses. So I, I was saying that a 64-bit memory address gives us an address space with two to the 64 different addresses, ranging from zero up to some gigantic number. Um, and so this sort of range. Of the range of all these different addresses that uh, exist in memory. This is our address space. Does that answer your question? Other questions? Yeah. The way you write the addresses looks like it's in hex, but the, then we're talking about bits on the other side. Uh, that's, that's a fair point that. Uh, I could have written out 64 bits of, of binary uh, for each of these. Um, and as we saw uh, last time, we can take any kind of binary and break it up into four bit pieces and turn each of those four bit pieces into the matching hex digit. And if we have a hexadecimal number, take each digit, turn it into four bits to get the binary. So they're interchangeable in that way. Uh, and when writing out memory addresses, typically written in hex just because the binary would be like, a lot longer without adding information. So 64 bit is truly 64 bit. It's just represented on the right. Okay. Yeah, so so 64 bit would be 16 of these hex digits to, to kind of represent all of those 64 bits. Other questions? All right, so another important idea here is that while each of these individual bytes has an address, it's not the case that uh, everything that we want to store on a computer system fits within a single byte. Uh, so for example, if I want to store an, an int, which, like in Java, is a, a, an integer type uh, in, in C. So I'm going to have the C type uh, on the left here and the size in bytes on the right. An int is a four byte integer value. Which means that in memory it's going to kind of span four of these spots in our in our array of bytes. Uh, if we have a bool or a char, which is kind of uh, a char being an one byte integer value representing 
uh, a character text. We have something called a short. Doesn't come up very often, but it's a two byte integer value. When we have a long, that is an eight byte integer value. Uh, and I should say these are the 64 bit sizes. On a 32 bit system, a long is actually the same size as an int. We have our float and double to floating point or real number types, uh, where a float takes four bytes and a double takes eight bytes, and those are the same on uh, the 32-bit uh, uh, system. And we can also, and this is uh, going to be very helpful uh, as we write code that is going to, to deal with kind of the, uh, uh, deal with kind of really detailed or low level uh, things in memory, we can have what are called pointers, or, uh, which are just variables that are themselves a memory address of some other data. So in, in C, we write that by having an asterisk follow some other type. So this. Type says, the star says this is a pointer to a one byte integer. So it's the address of some other data, in this case, a one byte integer. You can also similarly write down int star to have the address of some four byte integer. Now, on a 64-bit system, any guesses as to how many bytes a car star or an int star would be? Yeah. Uh, that means four for car star. Why do you say four? Uh, I might have seen it in the notes. Sure. Any other guesses? Yeah. Why do you say 16? Um, because if each memory address is 16 bytes long, then a pointer should be 16, right? That's, uh, that's the right way to think about this. However long a memory address is, that's exactly how many bytes a pointer is going to be. Uh, so in our 64-bit addresses, how many bytes is 64 bits? Yeah, so it's 8 bits per byte, so we'll have 8 bytes to store the memory address of uh, our character. But each memory address is going to be 8 bytes. That's the, we're basically giving the index of some other spot in this array of bytes. How about our our int star, how many bytes will that be? The same. Yeah. It would still be 8 because the address length doesn't change. Exactly. Both of these, even though they point to different kinds of things, they're both the address of something in memory. They're both an 8 byte memory address. Or on a 32 bit system, each memory address is 32 bits uh, or 4 bytes. Question? Uh, is that, is that then true of all pointers? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, every pointer is just a memory address. And the number of bytes in a memory address is determined by the word size of the system. So all memory addresses will be the same size. 
What other questions do you have? Yeah. So you can't use like less than a byte for, to uh, store something because like a boolean I don't think needs a whole byte, right? Since it's just like one or one value or the other. Uh, yes, uh, and actually in um, in older versions of C there was no bool type, uh, uh, but but newer versions have have added it. Um, so a byte is the smallest thing that we have a unique address for. So like within these eight bits, we don't have a way to refer to a particular bit in the middle of this with a memory address. The memory address just gets us to this byte. So it's possible that we could somehow construct a byte that contains a number of bits, all of which represent a different information. So we could, in fact, kind of fit eight true-false, eight ones and zeros into a single byte, but we'd have to do extra work to sort of pick out the one that we were interested in. It wouldn't have a unique address. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's clear to me why the, the pointers are 4 and 32 bit. Mm -hmm. uh, why is a long 4 and 32 bit? So uh, this, I would say, is a... A, a artifact of backwards compatibility. So what I mean by that is, in the world before 64-bit computers existed, uh, we didn't like there wasn't a, uh, a reason to have this long type. Once we had 64-bit computers, we want an 8-byte integer. Uh, because, as, as we'll see, the actual hardware is set up to deal efficiently with 8-byte, 64-bit quantities. Uh, but we want code to still like work well on 32-bit systems uh, that was written for 64-bit, if, if we can manage that. And when we do that, just say, OK, if we're, if we're running on a 32-bit system, we'll just treat longs as like, the sort of regular integers that we have on a 32-bit system. Uh, so it's not a pretty satisfying reason why it is this way. I think this is not great design, where the number of bytes in a particular type can vary depending on uh, what system you're running on. Java, for example, a long is always eight bytes, no matter what sort of system you're running on. But in C, it has this sort of this sort of artifact. Yeah. And then, uh, but that's that's purely an, an artifact of that backwards compatibility. You don't. An int isn't. An int isn't two bytes long. That's correct. Right. All of these other ones are the same on a 32-bit. It's just the long that is different. Um, yeah, which stands out as sort of a uh, uh, an awkward artifact. <coughs> All right, so before I get too much further, uh, I think it's important that I let you all know is about uh, the first president of the United States, George Washington. <laughs> Uh, so you've probably heard of George Washington. Uh, he shows up on, on money, on the flag from the state that I'm from, and uh, he was elected the first uh, president uh, of the United States in, in 1792. Um, the uh, U.S. Capitol was at that time in, in Philadelphia, and here's a sketch of the president's house uh, in Philadelphia where, where Washington lived. Um, and uh, as you might expect, during the term of the first president, there were many other firsts uh, in U.S. history. Uh, there was the uh, first uh, bank of the uh, United States, uh, a national bank. Um, there is no such bank now. Uh, this 
kind of system of a national bank uh, 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 no longer uh, uh, kind of disappeared in the 19th century. Um, and this bank played a role in the nation's first financial crisis uh, in 1792. There was uh, a financial uh, panic, um, and uh, they uh, add, then, as uh, uh, now, the U.S. government uh, kind of intervened to try and stabilize and, and bail out banks and kind of prevent uh, financial collapse. Uh, an important player there was the first secretary of the treasury, Alexander Hamilton. Another thing Hamilton uh, did was think that the government needed to raise some, some money and propose a tax on whiskey. Um, the people making whiskey really did not want to pay taxes, um, and this led to uh, the Whiskey Rebellion, um, where tax collectors were, were attacked, um, uh, tax offices destroyed, uh, and uh, when the, this was in Pennsylvania, and when the state of Pennsylvania didn't want to do anything about this, uh, the uh, uh, Washington called up uh, thousands of, of state militia uh, and uh, marched out. Uh, the uh, rebels went home before the army got there, so it was not actually any sort of battle. Um, but uh, this was a kind of important moment in, uh, in early U.S. history. All right, that is our that is our uh, uh, U.S. history facts for today. Um, all right, so the we talked about um, that we have quantities that span multiple bytes, and this brings up a question. where let's say we have uh, uh, the uh, integer x equals 32. Uh, let's convert that to hex. What is 32 in hex? Hex 20, exactly. Uh, but we know this is four bytes, so if I were to write out all four bytes, it would look like this, where it's hex 20 and there's just a bunch of zeros in front of it. Like, this may seem like a strange way to think about numbers, uh, and, it's all, and it's, I would say it's because we're not used to thinking of numbers as having a predetermined fixed width. Right, predetermined fixed number of bits that are used to represent that number. But in this case, our int is always going to use exactly 32 bits, exactly four bytes. And so we know that if the value is hex 20, well then there are just zeros in those other bits. Does that make sense? So if I'm arranging this in memory, Uh, so there are, before I say this, there are a couple of uh, terms that I want to introduce. This kind of rightmost or kind of lowest uh, byte here We might refer to it in kind of a couple different ways. I might call this the least significant byte, just like kind of the, the smallest places in this in this number. Sometimes you'll see this phrase, the, the, the uh, lower order or lowest order byte, synonymous with least significant. Um, similarly, kind of this uh, leftmost byte here, we call the most significant byte. So given that we have these four bytes, and we have kind of four spots 
uh, uh, four addresses in, in memory. Uh, I'll just arbitrarily choose hex 100, hex 101, hex 102, and hex 103 is the addresses of these four bytes. How should I arrange the four bytes of this integer in the four bytes of memory? Like I need to decide, like, okay, where does this least significant byte go? Where does the most significant byte go? And which of these addresses do I use to refer to the integer? Like, is the integer stored at address 103, address 100? So there are some decisions about how is memory going to be structured uh, that any computer system needs to make. So one decision that is the same everywhere is that when we have the memory address of some multi-byte quantity, we're going to use the lowest of the address, the, the lowest of the addresses uh, that this quantity takes up. So our four byte integer, if it is using these four bytes, we would say it's stored at address 100. So it uses the three bytes above that in memory. If it was an eight byte quantity, it would still be address 100 and go up to address uh, hex 107. So we'll use the, the address is the lowest, but we still have the question of which, which order do these bytes go in. And here's where uh, history is not our friend, sadly, and that there are just two ways to do this, and people use both ways. Uh, no one agreed on the one right way, and so there's The approach where we have the least significant byte first. So we'd say 20 first, and then the zeros. And because the least significant byte comes first, uh, we call this uh, little endian. And if we have the most significant byte first, which says this zero comes first, and we proceed from there, that is called big endian. This term endian uh, comes from uh, the uh, book Dolliver's Travels, which tells a satirical story about uh, uh, a kingdom plagued by wars over whether you peel a hard-boiled egg from the small end or the big end. You have the little endians, if you want to peel it from the small end because that's safer and you don't cut your fingers, uh, and uh, versus the, the people who, uh, it's traditional, peel it from the big end. Um, the point of this story, as is true of here, is that there's no reason why you would prefer one of these two ways over the other. It's just that we have to do it in some order. We either have to peel the egg from the small or the big end. We either have to have the least significant bite first or the most significant bite first. Um, and it's a historical fact that not everyone made the same decision. Yeah. Since there are two ways of reading the array, does that mean that every time we need to read one zero byte, we need to know what order it's in? Uh, that is that is correct. When when we are reading bytes out of memory, we need to know where they stored in little endian or big endian order in order to interpret them correctly. Uh, the good news is that most of the time, 
programmers don't have to think about this at all. Like, the system that you're using does one of these two things, and kind of from the program's perspective, it's just like you just read an integer from memory and you get, you get the right values. Um, for a bit of, of context, uh, little Indian shows up on um, kind of uh, 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 desktop uh, and laptop computers, uh, uh, smartphones. Um, so uh, this is kind of most likely what, what you're going to encounter. Um, uh, but data sent over computer networks is in big Indian. Um, uh, computer systems built by IBM or Oracle will also sometimes use Big Endian. Uh, uh, but it just means that when we're thinking very specifically about what bytes are in memory, we do have to, to care about this little versus Big Endian. Does that make sense? Questions on this? So uh, that means if we have a pointer to an integer, it will always point to the lowest address. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, the last uh, last bit of time that we we have, I'd like to start uh, start getting into C and kind of applying uh, these ideas about memory and memory addresses to how they show up uh, in C. Uh, so first, why would we learn C? I know that, that some of you uh, may have seen uh, C before if you've taken uh, 251 programming languages. Uh, that course uh, involves a fair amount of C. Uh, some of you have not used C before. Uh, that's totally fine. There's not an expectation. So I also say some of you may have a little easier time with C in this class, and some of you are going to be the lucky ones when you take 251. Uh, because you'll have seen C already here. So why do we use C in this class? Uh, it's going to help us think like the actual computer, because the code that we're writing in C has more similarities, is more closely related to what the computer system is actually doing underneath the surface than, say, either Java or Python is. Um, you'll also learn to appreciate how much your favorite programming language, be that Java, Python, JavaScript, uh, whatever it is, how much that language does for you that C does not do. Um, that said, C, C is still widely used uh, uh, in situations where resources are, are very constrained, uh, when performance is, is very important, uh, C, C will pop up. Um, and the pitfalls of the language continue to fuel devastating security vulnerabilities to this day. As there's lots and lots of C code still out there that's running on lots and lots of important things. And as we'll see later in the course, uh, there are some downsides to that. Um, so that's why we're using C in this course. Uh, you probably C is probably not the right choice for kind of your next uh, uh, your, your next personal project. Um, the sort of model of C is it's going to get out of the programmer's way uh, even when the programmer is unwittingly headed straight off. Right, it's just going to let you do whatever you want because it assumes you know what you're doing. Um, and uh, that's not necessarily a great trait in a programming language. Um, and there are more modern languages. Uh, one that I'm particularly interested in is called Rust, that uh, take a uh, that have kind of fixed a number of the problems with C um, while maintaining its strengths. Uh, but that is definitely the cost of some complexity. Uh, Rust is, is certainly a more a more com complex language than, than C. All right, so. If I were going to uh, if I were going to draw uh, a bunch of uh, a large number of bytes, um, I might want to 
I have put them in some giant, giant row. Um, uh, and I've divided up like so. Um, So I have 16 bytes here, and uh, I'll write the hex uh, addresses on top here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, now, if I wanted to keep going, say, put up a total of 40 bytes here on the board, uh, it would be very cumbersome to kind of leave it in this long list like this. So, kind of my approach to making this uh, uh, more understandable is to take kind of eight byte chunks and stack them on top of each other, just so that we can e more easily see. Uh, a bunch of uh, bytes in a row. So I would take those eight bytes there, and stack them on top like this, where I now put the kind of the address of the start of that row on the left here, and write down the offset along the bottom. So now this, the address of this byte is eight plus zero. The address of this byte is 8 plus 1, 8 plus 2, 8 plus 3, and so on. So uh, this is still kind of address hex E, or 14, 8 plus 6. Uh, but now I can kind of put a lot more, more easily see a large number of bytes, kind of arranging them in this way. Going over this very carefully because uh, I'm going to kind of use diagrams like this over the next several classes, and I want to make sure that we're all uh, comfortable with, with how to read them. Uh, kind of read across, and then sort of jump back to the start of the next row. Read across, jump back to the next, to kind of read uh, the bytes in order. Does this make sense? Uh, any, any questions on that? All right, so let's say that I have a little bit of C code, and I say int x equals pop. So uh, in this scenario, I am playing the role of the C compiler. And so in my role of C compiler, I get to decide which address this integer is going to be stored at. Uh, and I'm just going to choose to put it at address uh, C. So if this is little Indian, and I'm storing x starting at this byte, what value is going to be stored here? Yeah, will be our least significant byte, and then zeros for the other four. And then I'm going to say, I'm going to declare a variable int star, a pointer to an integer, called p. And then I'm going to set p equal to the address of x. And so this ampersand uh, 
is the address of operator, and it returns the, uh, the memory address of whatever uh, we apply it to. And so I decide that P is going to be stored at address 0 in my role as the C compiler. What is the value of the address of x? What is the value that I'm going to store in P? Yeah. Um, wherever the, the 0, 8 offset by 4 is. Yes, exactly. So P is going to be xc. That's the address that I put x at. And so when I'm storing the address of x, that's what I'll get. If my address, if this is a 64-bit machine, how many bytes, how, what is the size of P? Eight. Yeah, it's eight bytes. If it's little Indian, least significant byte goes there. Should actually be a zero C. And then all seven other bytes come after that. The other point, the only other point that I'll make since we're out of time is that these bytes that I haven't filled in. They could be anything. Like they're not necessarily zero. Like maybe someone used them before and put some some data there. We don't know. So it'll be a running theme that kind of we can't make assumptions about what's in memory until we we put something there. Uh, all right, that's all the time that we have today. Uh, I have uh, and I have my usual uh, office hours. Uh, starting in, in uh, at 3:30, uh, my office is Olin 3:39, um, uh, and uh, fill out the, the introductory survey if you haven't. Uh, for the clicker cards, just leave them on the table up here uh, as you as you exit, um, and I will see you Friday.